Ah, cool. All right, I'm back. Hey, how's it going, Ryan? It's good. Get close to that mic. Yeah, it feels good to be back in this mic. You all excited like I am? Yeah, you know, this WWDC, we, there are so many rumors, I am ready to go today. Yeah, I'm going to start laughing at Apple like crazy all what, week What are you long. talking about laughing? This is going to be one of the best WWDCs ever. Yeah, it's gonna There's going to be new maps, there's going to be new stuff, new hardware maybe. And more things for me to laugh at, saying, Why? look at all these terrible products that people are buying. What are you talking about? You loved your iPad. No, I didn't. I never liked that thing. You I, don't? I, you didn't love your iPad? I was really enticed by it because it looked so cool and I thought it was going to revolutionize my life, but it's a piece of crap. Expensive no, no, crap. No, it was great. We could make that music on it. We did make some music, but no, overall, it was crap. I love that thing. It was, yeah, it was just worthless. You, you didn't read enough on it. Yeah, I'm not going to burn my eyes out over it. Well, you know, the new iPad's even better. It's even worse. No, it's even better. There's four times as pixels. If it's by Apple, it's crap. No, it's great. It's crap. No, it's, it's crap. wonderful. It's crap. No, no. It's crap. No, it's not. This is a Nexus Special, Episode 7, WWDC 2012 Keynote, on Monday, June 18th, 2012, and now, with Spiders about to get your secrets. How's it going? Pretty good. It's good. So, uh, we're a little late here doing our WWDC coverage, because my initial guest decided to disappear, and my actual co-host is in Canada, so I had to go really far back into the depths of the internet to fish out one of my old great best friends from many, many years ago, and uh, I'm joined here today with uh, Brandon. So you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, um, my name is Brandon. Um, I, I've known Ryan for quite a few years, so we kind of go back a little bit. This is my first time on his podcast show, and I do graphic design and web design, uh, things like that. Yeah. So, uh, what, 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 um, what do you, what do you know about Apple in general? I, I don't think you're too much of an Apple fan, so that's why I have you on. Uh, no, I'm not really much of an Apple fan. Um, actually, and, and that's not in a bad thing in a bad way either, because I do like Apple and I like their products. I've tested certain things of theirs. Um, I do only have a little bit of experience with, you know, display models in the store or back in school. Believe it or not, um, I actually encountered the Apple twos, you know, the ones oh, that man. say, are you sure you want to quit? Mm -hmm. So I encountered those. So I have used Apple products. I haven't really ever been fond of them because obviously since PC was the bigger thing, um, I've always encountered having to use a floppy disk to take files back and forth to school, and then every time I take it there, it wants to format my IBM disks, so then I lose my files. Right. Well, going going all the way back to the Apple IIs, that's that's really long ago. <laughs> yeah, it was. And then the the iMac is actually the first um, computer that kind of appealed to me. You know, it kind of was a monitor. Yeah. But all yet in one. it had the computer. Yeah, all in one. Mm-hmm. And then later on, I also kind of liked that glassy-looking. What did they call it? Apple G2 or something? Well, uh, I, I don't. G4? Yeah, I don't. I don't really know the the lineup names for the iMacs, but they were all in the iMac line. Yeah. Yeah. So they had those single button, those kind that kind of used Chrome and glass, and that's kind of where Apple started getting that style they have today. Uh, but um, I've act I'm actually planning to get an Apple iPad sometime, and oh really? Also, yeah. Um, that's actually what I decided with my phone because obviously it's kind of a biased, two-sided world. Like it's either Android or Apple these days. Yeah. So, uh, so what I decided is, if you want the best of both worlds, you either get, you get one of each. So, what I just as a most, I think the most useful apps for the things I do would probably be on Android. So then I decided to get the rest of the apps. So why not get an iPad? Yeah, um, we we actually had an iPad here in the studio for a few months until it was stolen eventually, which was sad. But what we used it for was, um, as everybody says, it's not for media creation, but we actually did use it to create all of our album music. So, I mean, having an iPad is really handy, and my co-host, Matt, he didn't really, he wasn't incredibly fond of it, but I think for people who read a lot and 
who don't necessarily expect a computer out of it, it would be pretty useful. Yeah, indeed. So, uh, I think um, you saw the uh, WWDC video, right? Yes, I have. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to play WWDC summary in 90 seconds. And I believe this was put together by HardwarePhone.com, but also by Cult of Mac. Uh, so it's pretty nice. Uh, so I'm just going to play that now. And yeah, the hopefully... WWDC roundup. Yeah, it's pretty nice, actually. Hello. Good morning. This is our 23rd WWDC. Just a few updates. 400 million accounts, 30 billion apps. Exciting new changes. So let's get right to it. Phil? Good morning, everyone. So we're now updating MacBook Air with Ivy Bridge. USB 3, 999 MacBook Pro. Ivy Bridge, 1199 is shipping today as well. So what's next? Next generation MacBook Pro. It's thinner than my finger. The Retina display. Are you all sitting down? It's 220 pixels per inch, starting at 21.99 today. Thank you. OS 10. Good morning. Mountain Lion. 200 documents in the cloud. Developer SDK dictation. It's that simple. It's sharing. Mac users love to share. Cute little tweet sheet. Tweeting power nap keeps your Mac up to date while it sleeps is AirPlay mirroring game center. Mr. X here features for China next month, 1999. Let's talk about iOS 6. Enhancements to Siri. We're bringing it to the new iPad. Eyes free. Next 12 months. Facebook integration. Do not disturb. FaceTime over cellular. Passbook. Pay for your coffee. Guided access. Maps. Flyover. iOS 6. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming and joining us. Okay, so that was WWDC in 90 seconds. And the real keynote, which is also available on Apple's website, I think it runs about an hour and 12 minutes or something. It's pretty, it's not terribly long, but it was still pretty, pretty long, uh, you know, for, for that kind of thing. Um, so what, what did you think about the keynote overall? Well, overall, um, it's actually pretty impressive because um, after all the impressive things that Apple has put out um, these days, I mean they've, I mean they've come a long way, but they continue to push out a lot of nice features on these devices, and um, they they use this the the new internet technology to its fullest, and they're always finding a better way to do that. Um, I was actually pretty impressed with some of the things, and uh, one of the things that also um, kind of caught my attention was the price of their Mountain Lion operating system. Yeah, yeah, that was very impressive. I believe it was twenty bucks or nineteen ninety nine actually. Yeah. Yeah, and that's uh that's launching in July. So uh what 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 do you think of what do you think the reasoning is for making the Mount Lion update or upgrade so cheap? What do you think why do you think they're doing that? Um well if I had to guess, um I would say that they want to kind of get more of an audience, more welcoming of the Apple operating system. And it has already taken over a lot in in mobile devices, but I think on desktop computers, even though there are a lot of uh, uh, you know a lot of fans of their operating system, it's mostly known as even though it has not very many viruses, there's a lot less programs, and it's mostly aimed at media creation and um, other such things. So I do think that maybe they're trying to expand now and appeal to people that maybe. Um, are already into all these devices, so something that's more compatible with the devices, because I do think they are able to get more people to move over now, now mm-hmm. that they have people on that platform. Well, one of the things I think is interesting for the the Mount Lion update coming from Lion is traditionally in the old days, before Lion came out, so in the Leopard and Snow Leopard era, there were two operating systems that were supported. There was so in in during the Leopard era, it was Tiger and then Leopard. That's all that was supported. So current version, one version back. And then in Snow Leopard, it was Snow Leopard and uh, Leopard. So current version, one version back. And then in Lion, uh, for some reason, that kind of got a little bit changed. Uh, they supported Snow Leopard, and that was expected. They also start. They also continued to issue updates to a lesser degree to Leopard. And of course they supported Lion, so that was the current version. But now in Mountain Lion, they're still going to be supporting the Mac App Store and regular updates to some degree on Snow 
Leopard. Those names are just so confusing. So it, their, their, <laughs> their updating scheme now has changed from current version one version back to being this just, like, I don't know, three version, like, thing. And I think what they're trying to do is they're, they did admit they're switching to a one year update cycle, but they're also trying to make updates faster and they're trying to get people with, to have newer systems faster. Um, one of the, one of the reasons they have to charge is a legal reason. They can't make these operating system class updates free. It's one of those legal things that they, they've talked about in the past, but they're trying to make it as cheap as possible so that people can get to the latest operating system faster so that they can push out new changes faster. So, uh, when whatever, whatever's after Snow Leopard, or I mean, Mountain Lion, sorry, uh, whatever's after that, they can start getting that out faster because it's going to be coming out in a year. So the more people they have on whatever actually is current, the better for them. Yes, I, I do think that um, one problem with operating systems is if they they seem like they really um, were focusing on making things a lot more seamless, like you said, um, more more updates, keeping things up to date, and also um, when there's upgrades. It seems like Windows is kind of making a pretty big mistake there. And uh, it, where it does, a lot of people, even though they're really happy with Windows 7, with Windows, and sometimes with Windows Vista, but not so much, um, it actually forces the computer to reboot, so then you lose all your work. And I do notice that in the, um, the Apple keynote, that they did mention something about updates while you're idle or asleep yes. or something like that. So that, that was one of the so, new features, yep. Yeah, so I do think that if they can pull that off without, you know, making people lose their work and all that, um, then that would be better. And also, I think also the migration of data, I don't know if Apple has taken that into account, but if your people are able to move their settings over and maybe even programs, because most people hesitate to update, and I know this from personal experience too, but even though I know I'm an extreme case of that. You're very extreme. Um, yeah, once you customize things how you want it, you don't really want to move to the newest thing because then you have to start all over again. And, and that's especially true for mobile devices most of the time. So for one of the things that I, I don't know what Apple does for Mac to Mac, but they do have a migration assistant for Windows. But of course, the settings and the customization that your Windows computer has, they probably won't carry over that well to your new Mac. So I don't know if it matters that much. And, of course, programs are usually incompatible except for Office, maybe Photoshop, and not too many programs overlap. So that's kind of a weird thing, too. Yeah. So let's get into the hardware that was announced. Uh, the first line of hardware that was announced were uh, updated MacBook Airs. And so I bought my current MacBook Air last July, and so the new MacBook Airs are featuring an Ivy Bridge processor, USB 3, and uh, the sadly new MagSafe 2 connector. Uh, and I don't think they talked about it too much, but that new connector is incompatible with old power adapters for Apple computers, and it's just so ridiculous. Yeah, I hear a lot of complaints even today about um, even mobile phone chargers, how they they kind of standardize their own kind of charger and even though most mobile phones or even other devices are starting to go to more of a standard plug, yeah. Apple sort of continues their own. And now even then, the, now they're making a new standard where they're out, outdating their older connectors. So now it's even more complicated. So what, what do you think about the um, MacBook Airs, the, the thin, almost wafer-thin computers? Well, I do think they look pretty nice. Um, I haven't personally gotten to have a hands-on experience with a, an Apple laptop or, you know, a MacBook. Um, I do think that they're nice, and I also like how they're, you know, up to date and, um, you know, they, they're exceeding the 3 gigabyte or gigahertz limit, which most computers, it seems like they're, they're trying to get near 3 gigahertz, but they're not really passing it very much. Probably, I don't know, you know, uh, the, the cost-effective approach. Well, one um, of the reasons they're probably trying to shy, keeping co clock speed under three is um, due to heating issues. But the other reason probably is it just doesn't matter because the processor usually in, in a small notebook like the MacBook Air and even generally the Mac Pro or MacBook Pro, uh, generally that clock speed doesn't have as much of an effect as either graphics or a solid state hard drive. So I think for the most part, 
the the allure of the MacBook Air is the thinness, and of course they're keeping that here. And for the next generation, they can make it even thinner because they put the new port on. Yeah, I do think that's nice. Um, they are making a lot of um, bold moves lately uh, on other companies. I mean, towards cloud computing, as in devices where you don't really have a hard drive; it's all on the cloud. Um, and I do notice that Apple is um, going towards the cloud direction, but I also like that they still take the, the, the PC approach, the, the Mac approach, where they still have a hard drive and they still have um, the high-end things because uh, really a lot of the netbooks that have a problem, I do like the pricing on the netbooks, but you'll also notice that um, a lot of the specs on them don't allow things that you would normally you know, do online, such as gaming and uh, sometimes um, HD videos and such. Right. Well, even on a netbook, doing a intensive Skype call could make it melt. So we know yeah, that's a problem. So let's see. The next thing that Apple announced at the keynote was, of course, the new MacBook Pro. Now, of course, they did update the regular MacBook Pros, but they added this new MacBook Pro, which has this gorgeous retina display, or so I hear anyway. So uh, since you haven't really had too much experience with the MacBook Pros themselves, have you seen um, one of the new iPads with the retina display? I have seen the Retina display, and they do look pretty sharp, and they they do look nice. Um, that's actually one of the things I thought about when I was going to get a phone, since I almost went for an iPhone 4S, but then I went for Android. Good but choice. The re- yeah, <laughs> the the Retina display was a good um, a good selling point, and to top it off, um, you always hear that the Apple devices have the better camera, even mm-hmm. though they match in megapixels, they have the better camera. And giving a better screen, it's kind of a, a good combination to, to lure in those kind of people that would like the high quality. Yeah, this, this new MacBook Pro is just, uh, I mean, it's pretty expensive, but what the, the resolution it's offering is 2880 by 1800, and I don't know how much bigger that is than 1080p, but it's pretty big, or it's 60%, no, 40% bigger than a 1080p. Um, so I mean, that's really impressive. It is pretty impressive. And, of course, it's on a 15-inch screen, so, I mean, it's just really packed in there. So when so you've, you've obviously seen the iPhone 4S, and you probably used one a little bit, at least in the store. Um, so when I, when, when I looked at the new iPad, so the iPad 3, the one with the red display, I didn't think I could really tell a major difference between sharpness and, and you know, just regular, because I had been using my Matt's... Uh, iPad for months in the studio here for show stuff. So, I mean, I didn't think that it mattered that much, but I think in general on a laptop, maybe not so much the pixels per inch is what matters, but the resolution gain is really what's going to be great in that case. Yeah, I agree. So imagine Um, working um, on your 1080 video in window, you know, it's just like full 1080 and you don't even have most of the window covered up or the screen covered because it's just so small compared to the rest of the screen. That's it's going to be great. Yeah, it will be. So, how, when when do you think this kind of high resolution display will trickle down to normal people laptop prices? Well, I mean, if you really look at the HD TVs and the other high resolution technology, it has dropped in price quite a bit. But it has also taken about six or seven years for it to really get down there. So I do think that um, it will drop down there. But the problem is they're always getting new technology, sort of like organic LEDs for oh, yes. certain screens. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's also one of the appeals of what I got my devices. Um, I don't really know the whole technology behind it, but since each pixel is lit, if it's black, then it's saving power in a way. But um, I do think that we also have to watch out for more um, displays that would actually maybe appeal to us more than what's out there now. So what's out there now will more than likely become cheaper if something new does come out, but then we'll end up wanting something new, so right, then we'll be behind again. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's interesting with these high-resolution displays, since Apple's coming out with it on a single laptop right now, as soon as Apple saturates the market, the high-end market with these high-end displays, eventually... Regular person laptops will have to again get some get that to compete. So I think that'll uh, not happen, you know, too soon. But it'll happen within a few years. So that's pretty good. Yeah. So let's see here. 
So let's talk about Mountain Lion, which I believe is what we were talking about earlier, which is the next operating system in Apple's lineup. And so we learned about Mountain Lion actually in February, I believe, and Apple did something a little bit weird. They they flew in press people, um, you know, the big names in the blogging and tech news industry, and they flew in people to New York, and then, like, in a little room, person by person, they demoed Mountain Lion to these people and then blogged about it thereafter. And it was the weirdest thing, because it, it they don't normally do that. And then the week after that, they also put out a beta for it. Or a developer preview or something. So, I mean, have you used the um, the current, not, not maybe the current one, but have you used a recent version of um, OS X? Um, unfortunately, I haven't. Um, I have seen it in use, and I have thought about um, trying it out. I haven't actually gotten into it yet, but um, I have actually seen um, previews of, of each of the versions, so... Um, I do notice that each version they go up, it does look more appealing to me, so they must be doing something right. Ah, that's what you, that's, that's a good answer. <laughs> well, so uh-huh. one of the new things they're bringing to this is they're bringing Siri, but not really Siri. They're bringing just regular dictation to the Mac. So I don't know what the key commands are, but you can hit some key and then you can talk to your laptop or your desktop or whatever you have and it will try to figure out what you just said and then put it into the text field you're typing in, and that'll be really cool. So with your Android phone that you just got, you can also do voice dictation. So what do you think about voice dictation? I do think it's a really nice feature. I mean, over the years, I think the idea of it is has been a lot, like, um, really ahead of its time, the idea itself, because years ago... Like, that was the idea about, like, when most people started getting into computers, they started imagining, like, voice commands, voice recognition. But a lot of the earlier programs kind of made it a pain. And I think all the experimenting with the older voice technology kind of wore everyone out because, um, you know, having to repeat certain words over and over on the older software. I do think if they get it right, they will change people's minds now because I do think that the... um the voice recognition has um, sort of frustrated a lot of people, and they just gave up on it. But I think Apple is doing it right, and in my opinion, I do think that Apple does have probably the best voice recognition technology at the moment. So have you ever tried Siri and like on the iPhone? I haven't actually tried it. I've actually been a little nervous, too, because... <laughs> Siri kind of has something a little different to her. She seems a little more real than the other voice programs. Yes, that is definitely true. Um, I haven't used so I haven't used Siri either, not even at the store because I, I, I'm just not interested in it. But I have used extensively the Android version of what Siri is, which is just I don't know voice control or whatever. I don't even think they have a real name for it on Android. But I mean, I use it all the time for searching stuff and just you know doing simple stuff. So I, I like the idea of voice dictation, but there are some things that sometimes you wouldn't want to use it. So for instance, when you're sitting in a crowded room, you don't want to be talking to your computer. Open calendar. You know, you don't want that to happen. So I, I don't. It's not like the end all of using a computer. It's just another thing that you can do to make things faster or maybe easier. Yes, and I do think that um, as it gets more popular, that will be a problem, is that it'll either disturb someone or so many people will be saying it that maybe someone else's voice will interfere with yours. So maybe the next step in it would be actually recognizing a specific voice. Right. You know, can just just imagine you're a parent and you're trying to tell Siri to, I don't know, do something, and then your kid's walking by and it's like, blah, and then the, the thing gets messed up. Oh, just, that's that's what kids do. So, one of the other things, the next piece of software Apple put into their keynote this time was what we were also talking about earlier, or briefly mentioned, what which which is called PowerNap. And so, you mentioned that the operating system can download updates, not necessarily install them, but download updates while the laptop or desktop is asleep. And that's pretty cool. So, it, it doesn't just do that, it actually also will allow you to take uh, mail, calendar, reminders, and also sync notes and location data and photos, all from iCloud and other services, even while the computer's generally asleep. 
I wonder what technology they're using to do this, because it also will work on my MacBook Air, so it's not as if it's exclusive to new hardware. Uh, and I think that was pretty interesting. Yeah, it is pretty interesting, and I have seen similar type things, not exactly as advanced as that, because they do have a feature that doesn't really get used very much in, in computers called Wake on LAN, and that's where you can have your computer awake from a sleeping state using the network. And I haven't actually seen anything beyond just waking the computer up, so it's possibly in a lower state of power, but I don't imagine it being in such a low state that the hard drive is off and other such things. But then again, they're going to solid-state drives, so it's right. not like that's going to matter anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting that they're bringing this out. And one of the things I think this opens up is kind of the ability to do other things. Or it, it just it makes it more like their iPad and iPhone devices. So it makes this MacBook Air or it makes their MacBook Pros or whatever. It makes it more like the mobile devices because you never really think of your phone as sleeping, per se. It's just that the screen is off. So normally when you think about your computer being asleep, you think about you don't think about its screen just being off. You think about the whole thing just not using power. So it's kind of bringing the just it's there, it's doing stuff, waiting for you, uh, like, I don't know, idea, but it's bringing it to computers. So I think that's a really great thing that they're bringing. Yeah, it is a great feature, and um, I do think that it, it is a good thing that they're doing that, especially since now they're actually learning to be more conservative about the energy because, as you know, computers do take quite a bit of power to keep on all the time, which is why they have hibernate and standby. But um, I do think that would change a lot of things because that is true that when it is in a lower power state, um, that's how I see it on mobile devices because when I first got um, a smartphone, as in a BlackBerry, what I noticed about it, when I first got it, I didn't completely think of it as a computer. So when I went to shut it off, I was thinking, oh, wow, that it's like a computer, but yet it, it turns on fast. But what I learned is that it was only going in a low-power state. Right. The problem is is that they made it difficult to reboot them. And then when you did reboot it, you actually realized how just how slow it was booting up. And they're getting a lot better with that. But I do kind of like how they're bringing that to um to actual desktop computers and, and MacBooks and, and laptops. I just think the name for this feature is so funny. It's called Power Nap. And it's like, and it's never a feature any normal person is going to reference. It's just they're going to be using one of the applications and then suddenly their mail is just going to be updated despite not having used their computer for three hours. I mean, it's going to be great for normal people. They won't know what's happening. They'll just enjoy it. Yeah, I agree. Mm-hmm. So let's see here. Uh, Safari got updated. Safari's updates include um, a unified search bar, I believe, which I need to actually make sure that's true because I don't... Oh, oh, it is true. Wow, I'm impressed. Uh, a, uni <laughs> a unified search bar, so now it's actually like Chrome. That's really great. So any browser that's like Chrome is better than no browser like Chrome. Uh, so now it also has tab syncing, which is kind of cool. And it also has multi-device syncing. So if you had an iPad and you had uh, a desktop from Apple, your tabs would sync um, so that you could browse one place and then you know go somewhere else and then browse another place on your other device. So that that's pretty nice. Yeah. Um, one thing that confuses me about that, and I'm sure they have the bugs worked out, is what if on both systems are they constantly synced? Or do you think that maybe somehow they have, like, two different states of it? Because would it be, like, another window? Or well, how do you think that would work? Their implementation here, I don't think it's, like, it's not as if they're downloading and then, like, maintaining copies on each device. What they're essentially doing is just keeping the URLs, like, consistent. So if you, well, one, that brings up another question. But so the, what they show, uh, in, what they showed in the keynote was that Safari has a list of windows open on the current device on your iPad and on your iPhone or whatever other devices you have synced to your iCloud account. So it just shows you the tab titles and then it, it's probably just like a URL that you click and then it will load on that computer. But what, what that might also bring up is like you and I, we have hundreds of tabs open on a single computer and <laughs> it would pr get pretty unwieldy really fast. I think if, you know, a hundred 
I don't know, t- titles and URLs were listed in this little drop down menu for iCloud to open up a tab on my iPhone or iPad or whatever. So that's kind of weird too. Yeah, I agree. Um, one thing I also noticed about that, which would be an issue is since they haven't quite gotten rid of Flash completely and Apple devices don't support Flash, so if there was a site that was completely reliant on Flash, then that site would obviously not work on the other device. Right. That's the only fault I see now, but of course they are going to HTML5 now. And also, I do think it is a really nice feature because I have found myself trying to get to a site that I am on on my computer, and then what I'll actually resort to is using a QR code scanner. But really? The problem, indeed, yes. yeah. That's, that's um, a lot of work. Why don't you just email it to yourself? That would be pretty easy, actually, too. Yeah, that would but probably be easier. You also have QR code generators. But then there's another problem I found out with that. If you aren't completely up to date with the technology, like I still have my nice... It's, it has a nice depth to it, you know, the square CRT monitors. Yeah, I know, you and your square. Yeah, <laughs> since they're flickery, since they actually have frame rates to them, um, you'll actually try to take a picture and the QR code will be distorted because <laughs> it has these little flickery lines going through right. it. Right. <laughs> well, yeah, that, that's probably not a good thing either. <laughs> well, let's see. I do think it would, I do think it'd be a useful feature for people, but yeah, yeah go on. Um, well, so what I use, I don't, traditionally I don't sync my tabs because I just find that obnoxious because I have thousands open among different computers. Like literally right now on my desktop I have like 20. On the MacBook Air right now I have all my WWDC keynote tabs open and somewhere else I probably have another 20 open. I, I don't do that, but if you use Chrome, of course, they, Chrome has had this built in for at least a few versions now and even before Chrome had tab sync open, or available, um, Xmarks and Firefox had plugins for Chrome and uh, Firefox itself. Uh, so, I mean, you could you could have synced your tabs for years and not relied on this feature. I just think this feature is kind of a way to bring it to more normal people. So if they do have more Apple ecosystem devices, they can get to their stuff easier. Yeah. I do think there is one issue, though, that they should think about, and hopefully they have thought about it. But it's actually something I just thought of that if you if you are syncing tabs with two computers, obviously there's going to be sites that you have to log into. So if you log into something on your computer and then it syncs with your phone, does that mean if someone in the other room has your phone, they're able to access your account then? No, I think the implementation is much simpler than that. It, it's what it's literally doing is just syncing URLs between devices. Uh, so it finds out what URLs are open in the in the uh, in that window in those tabs and then just puts them in a nice little list with the fave icon and the tabs title bar title uh and then you'd have to do whatever you need to do to get back into it so ah. um it, it's not so sophisticated that it's a security problem it's basic enough to do what is probably expected by the 90 percent of use cases by 90 percent of the people well that works out i think so so I think we should talk about also one of the things that Apple got rid of in this keynote, which was the 17-inch MacBook Pro. Now, I've always told people that if you get a laptop and it's 17 inches, you're insane because you can't carry it anywhere for more than like 20 minutes before your back turns to mud. So, I mean, I, I, a lot of my friends, you know, we, we this is our first year of college here, and a lot of my friends got gaming laptops because they wanted a laptop so they could bring it places, but they wanted a game too. And of course, a gaming laptop is usually 17 inches, and it's thick, and it's heavy. And I just make fun of them all the time. And so one of the things Apple did here was they got rid of the 17-inch MacBook Pro. So do you, do you see it? Do you think there's a trend of going to thinner and not and, and smaller screened computers with this higher resolution that Apple's now offering with the Retina display? Do you think that's going to be a trend? It may be, and actually, if people want to stay on Apple, they don't really have a choice. I mean, you don't really have much of a choice with upgrading Apple computers. They Apple kind of likes things to be nice and soldered in there. They don't want anything coming loose. That's definitely so I true. don't think, yes. So um, I think if people actually want to have like a gamer display or something, they'd probably would think about hooking up a projector or an external screen if it actually became a problem. But I do think the trend would be to accept that screen size that Apple's trying to set. 
Well, so Apple prefers, apparently prefers the seven, the, the 15.4 inch screen size to the 17 inch screen size. And I think one of the reasons in the past was in order to stuff a discrete graphics card into a tiny little laptop, literally the laptop had to be bigger. And although, otherwise it would get too hot, not have enough surface area to cool off, and there just wouldn't be enough space for extra battery life and also the discrete graphics card. But I think now, over time, technology has gotten to the point where you can stuff a really great graphics card into a smaller space. Yeah, I I do see that kind of trend going on. Um, Then, And that is something that they're trying to do now, is make things smaller and lighter, more, more capable of moving around. Right. So let's talk about iOS 6. So you looked at the iPhone, uh, you looked at the iPhone 4S that came out last October. So one of the new things that's being added into iOS 6 this time is this thing that is replacing Google Maps. And it's not anything special, it's just called Maps now, which is what it was called before. But they're no longer using the Google Maps surface as the, I don't know, data sync for it. So now they're now they're doing they're they're rolling their own maps, I guess. So what do you think of the new mapping technology they're using in this? Well obviously anything that they have they would have to keep up with Google because Google has been offering it for free. They've kind of set a new bar for um free GPS and now, you know, I I've always um thought about getting one of those hundred dollar um devices you know, just just a standard GPS yep. unit. But um, now that I have it built into my phone, I mean, that saves you money, and um, it's actually a nice feature. So one and of the differences, one... one of the differences between the Android navigation and the Google version of navigation on uh, on iOS was that there were no turn by turn directions on iOS with the Google Mapping app as opposed to on Android where there is, and that's why one of the reasons I picked Android. Of course, that's all changed now, but I still pick Android. Yeah, that's one of the reasons I picked it, too. Yeah, I mean, I, I love turn-by-turn navigation, because otherwise you have to look at the map all the time, and you have to figure out what to do. Um, so one of the things they're doing here is they're they're putting into the, these 3D, or, yeah, full essentially full 3D maps. And do, do you care if your map is in 3D or not? I mean... Um, I've kind of gotten used to the standard of GPS to just be a, a flat standard map. I mean, it's not like they ever went to 3D on a paper map unless it's a hologram. <laughs> no. But, <laughs> but I do think that um, maybe you would add a little bit more confusion. If I mean, I'm sure they have it all set up right, but and it would really look nice, but it could also be distracting if they don't do it quite right. And well, I mean, I obviously, one of the things I've always thought about is, you know, you you you, you set your phone or whatever to uh, go down from your house to some store from 20 miles away, and you turn 3D maps on, and you know, you you look at your screen, and you it looks like you're about to run into a building or something, or you know, you don't really like. I don't see the obvious use of what 3D maps would really be like, but the Apple implementation of what 3D maps are is actually kind of cool. So instead of just showing you like a top-down view of uh, maps, what it really shows you is it shows you the road, and then it shows you not like a detailed like picture-style 3D. It shows you like cubes overlay like you know where you're you're on the road in your car, and then it shows you cubes representing buildings to their specific height. So it'll show you the shapes and the curvature of roads and it'll show you things. So it actually gives it some visual depth. So you're more of like a 45 bird angle instead of hovering right over where your car is. So it's almost actually a nice thing, but in the way I imagine it in my mind, it's just so useless. Yeah, it, it, it probably isn't too practical for most situations like that, especially if it's just going to be a short drive. And sometimes you just like to put the GPS on because, I mean, you kind of don't want to really think about what, like, where you're going. You just want to do like, okay, I'm, I'm driving and then I'll just do what it says. Because I've even caught myself doing that a couple times if I just don't feel like thinking about the route that I've been on before. Right. Um, 
So I do think that there could be uses because sometimes you do get to your destination, you look around and you're like, where is it? Because this one time um, I actually was trying to find a store for someone on a, a standard GPS uh, type layout on the map. And this problem I had, and, and this is probably going to be a problem uh, with the Apple thing too, unless they get it right. But um, whenever you see like a little shopping area that um, I noticed that Google Maps do map out all the roads, but whenever there's a little shopping area with like 20 shops in there, they don't really tend to do anything about it. Like they show the shopping area, but they don't show the individual buildings. So when they say your de- where your destination is, it tends to be out in the road somewhere right. away from it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's a common problem with that. If they actually show the buildings, I do think that would make it a lot easier to find it. And when you first mentioned 3D maps, I sort of mentioned, uh, I imagine it, that maybe would drain a little bit more power, but since you say it's cubes, um, obviously I think that would actually not be too bad. Right. Especially if it's an optional feature. Well, and, probably- in, and in fact, uh, the way that the, um, 3D cube cube map. So like there is a way to overlay the actual image imagery over those cubes, but the cubic map is actually a collection of vector art um generated by the server. So it's really tiny and then it's just, you know, puffed up to size to the screen you need it to be um because it's all vector based so it can scale infinitely. So that's really nice. So I mean yeah. it wouldn't actually I don't think end up taking more power to do the cubic map versus just a regular 2D standard map. Yeah, I do think they have that down with the maps where they're, they're actually utilizing that now, the, the vectors. Like, but before they'd use all these images, it would take, uh, a lot more bandwidth. They're getting a lot more efficient with the bandwidth. So I do think the directions will come faster too. Mm-hmm. And with people capping the data on all well, the providers capping the data to two gigabytes and such, I don't really think that it's worth it to, um, have a GPS that would um, drain the textures off the server. Um, it would actually take a lot more bandwidth, so the have vectors really would help a lot. Right. So the next thing they also put into iOS 6 was FaceTime on mobile networking. So you, if you're on 3G or 4G, preferably 4G, um, you can use FaceTime now. So You just got your new phone, your new phone capable of actually doing things, I might add, because a BlackBerry obviously can't do more than type, right? Not very much. I mean, you can type, you can do email, you can do BBM, but then it stops right about there. Yeah, exactly. So now on your new phone, you can do stuff. And actually, you're Skyping with me right now using your phone, right? Yeah, I am, which would be pretty difficult on my old phone. Right, exactly. So... The new thing they added is FaceTime over cellular, uh, is what, that's what they're calling it. So, uh, Skype has had this feature for eons, I guess. Uh, you could have used Skype to call, uh, people for, for a long time. And now they're just getting around to adding FaceTime into, uh, the allowed apps that can use cellular data. So it's kind of interesting. What, what do you think the reasoning is for allowing that now rather than early on when it came out? Um, well, I do think one of the problems is probably that, um, the, well, I'm guessing it has to do with the bandwidth itself mm-hmm. because um, mostly on the 3G, like everyone was all excited about 3G, and it is pretty impressive compared to GSM and CDMA, but when you get down to it, it's actually, um, it's kind of like that $15 a month cell phone or mobile plan that or, sorry, I mean broadband plan that you get for your home, which right. is fast, but it's not really good for streaming video. Mm-hmm. So what you're dealing with is skipping video, and it's just wasting your bandwidth and causing frustration. I remember they had this, um, I believe it was a T-Mobile commercial, T-Mobile probably. Anyway, they had this commercial um, making a joke about AT&T, how um, once you go away from your Wi-Fi, it's going to start skipping a lot and cutting out. So I do think that um, they're past that kind of joke now because now they have 4G now. And I do think that's why they're feeling safer about the video. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure they have better ways of compressing that video. So it probably is turning out to be a better feature to have on it. But I still do think that with them capping the data plans, that that might still be an issue. But people that really want to video chat, it's nice that they'll be able to have that feature. Yeah, definitely. So 
I think we covered the important points of iOS 6. It wasn't very an ex- a very exciting reveal. I mean, we kind of knew what was going to happen with it. Um, I mean, Siri is now going to be available on the new iPad, the iPad 3, but we already knew what Siri could do. I mean, it's not that exciting. Um, one of the things that did happen, though, was uh, n- not mentioned in the keynote, but happened on the Apple website, was the Mac Pro was updated. Uh, kind of secretly, but it turns out a day later, the Mac Pro had its little new designation removed. So, it's kind of weird. So, have you ever seen a Mac Pro? They're the big, silvery cases? I don't know. Um, I actually don't think I've seen them very often. No. Uh, yeah, they're not really out there too much. You'll see them once in a while, but Mostly at the bigger computer stores or, yeah. or, you know, yeah. So the Mac Pro was updated, and by updated, I mean not at all. Uh, I, I don't even have, like, a way to compare here because no, nobody, like, it didn't change enough to even bother making comparison charts. So the essentially what they did is they lowered the price a little bit in terms of what Mac Pros cost. So a regular baseline Mac Pro used to cost, I believe, 3600 Now it costs just 3000 And... I mean, nobody was pleased with this update. So, every, and it, everybody just everybody who wanted a Mac Pro was just so angry. So that that was one of the things they didn't talk about. And so, one of the things that Tim Cook said a couple of weeks ago at the D10 conference was that um, Apple is double du- doubling down on secrecy. They're going to be more secret than ever before. And some some person, just some guy, sent an email to Tim Cook recently complaining about the Mac Pro and the lack of an update during WWDC, and Tim Cook actually responded to him and said, well, we're making a new Mac Pro for 2013. So it's so much for doubling down on secrecy, huh? Yeah. 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 I do think that the secrecy thing is a little odd because if you think about it, um, MacBooks and other such things have always been sort of... You know, they don't really want you in there tampering with anything, doing your own upgrades anyway. They solder things in, they seal things shut. So I think it's pretty secret already. So then for them to go even more secret, they must have better plans going or maybe they just want to keep their market. But either way, um, they must have something coming out. Otherwise, I don't think they would make such um, decisions like that. Right. Well, I mean, I, I, one of the reasons for the secrecy is to keep, keep the audience captivated. Like, if, if you, if you have it too gradual, like, if there's not a, like a big thing every so often, people tend to get disinterested. And if, if things aren't secret, if things are just said, like, plainly all the time, people also get disinterested. So, w- one of the things that the secrecy does on the part of announcements is that they can, like keep people interested every so often, make it a big thing that people get really excited for, high expectations, and then just just that that makes people you know wait and be anxious and like ready to buy at the moment's notice. Yeah, it is a smart move on their on their side about that, um, getting people to uh, getting people into it ahead of time. Uh, one of the things I also noticed. Uh, they do make a pretty big deal about how they unveil things at the Apple things, the events that they they, that yep. they do. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also notice that um, the way they unveil things, sometimes they do it a little bit more in advance. But I mean, it's kind of understandable because a lot of their devices are pretty expensive, and I know there's a kind of a commodity for it, like um, they they like. Uh, the general public likes uh, Apple. It's kind of a well-known thing. It's known to be stable. It is a quality product that they're making, too. But I've also sort of had this theory that part of the reason things are so overpriced is because since uh, they can't really mass-produce things quite as much as, as um, actual PCs can with their products, the price point's still a little higher because they can they make less things than they do on the the actual the normal side of the things and you know out, not out inside of Apple. Well, that might be true to some extent, but I think in general that 
for the most part, like, what Apple tends to do is they tend to buy up resources in advance. So a couple of years ago, Tim Cook, he's, he, back then he was the, um, supply chain and distribution guy. He, he, he mentioned that Apple was investing like six billion dollars in components for like the next five years. And it turns out what that was, it was, it was, um, production capacity for screens. And now we understand why, because they made the iPhone with its high resolution screen. And then they made the iPad with its high resolution screen. And now, of course, they made the new MacBook Pro with high resolution screens. So I think what Apple tends to do is they tend to buy up the resource that they think is going to be in general in most short supply in the future. So I think they kind of escape that, I don't know, uh, like supply and c- constraint without having that economy of scale thing. That is true. They do do that sometimes. Um, I think that was also a good move um, for them to do that. Oh, yeah. I mean, that was great because they, they, they saw what they had and they, they knew to jump on it and buy a lot early. That was very well done. Yeah, there is one problem I know with it. I don't, uh, with what they're doing. I don't know if they do it now, but, uh, typically most companies tend to have their manufacturing done in Asia, usually in around China. Yep. And then that's also where you hear about, since you have these, um, factories working on these products, um, I think they are a little smarter with having individual parts made at different places and not having an actual full device assembled in some places, but, uh, one of the problems is that things do leak out more that way. Right. Well, so the um, iPhones actually have their processing chip, the A5 chip, uh, manufactured in Texas, in Austin, Texas, I think. And then the chips are made oh, there good. in the Samsung plant, and then they're shipped back to China for assembly, and then the actual phone is shipped it back to the U.S. for selling or, you know, across the world, too. So it's kind of funny that like not even not even like specific components are being made just in one place they're made all over the place indeed and there is one um other thing i heard about in that part um there this is some probably old news now but there was a while back uh, some company was trying to sue apple for some kind of patent or something that was done and I guess they were trying to push Apple out of the country, as in they couldn't manufacture there anymore, which obviously didn't come to pass because they're still they're still making things there. Right. But I do think it's a little bit silly how there's a lot of the shipping going on, um, things leaving the initial country that they'll be selling in and going way like a really far distance away, like to China, like from Texas, and then coming back to be sold again. I don't know if that uses that much cost there, but um, they must be doing it efficiently in some form if they don't, if they continue to do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I think Apple's doing a great job with their momentum in terms of all the devices. Um, for me, I, I I mean I don't I, I'm not loyal to any specific brand. Uh, I, I I bought the MacBook Air because it was the lightest laptop on the market with probably the best reviews. I'm I'm loyal to what works. I, that's what I like to tell people anyway. And I mean, if if a Windows desktop or laptop, you know, was really no, desktop wouldn't be light, but if a laptop, a Windows laptop was light and really fast and you know looked really great, I mean, I would totally get that too. So I, I think Apple's doing a great job there, and I think they'll continue to keep doing that. Yeah, I think they will too. One of the reasons I've um, also gone for things is kind of I kind of relate to you in a way and. Because I do try to get things that last a long time. Um, different brands do make. Um, I don't know if I would say they make their their hardware where it will fail intentionally, but I have seen this um, problem with a, a particular model of my Asus motherboard. Mm-hmm. Um, it actually failed. Um, I bought one and it failed after two years. The next one I got with a warranty the same model it also failed after two years and then i got a different model um a different brand completely actually what brand did you go to i went to gigabyte oh yeah that's what i use yeah 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 well it is a good motherboard and it has lasted it's far exceeded the two years where the asus motherboard would burn out right because 
Yeah, since 06. So you could say that's, I mean, I'm almost afraid that it'll burn out because of how paranoid I am about the last disasters. Right. But it is, it is holding up and, and I don't overclock my things. So obviously I want things to last. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it has done a good job though, but, um, I, I mean, I've, I've been, how Apple does things. I've been, I I don't know. I, Apple designs their own motherboards, but one of the reasons I, prefer gigabyte for my motherboards is because google uses them for their server farms so if if it's good enough for google it's good enough for me <laughs> yeah that's that is a good idea and in fact i um i've been looking at building a new computer but in the meantime since i don't have enough money for that yet um i i bought some uh more memory for my uh tower here which is actually recording the show right now uh and the memory lets me record more without having to write to the drive all the time so that'll be really nice indeed yeah. So overall, how, how what, what do you what do you think of uh, the uh, keynote? Um, I do think they has done a lot of nice things, and um, there are things that even I look forward to. But obviously, not using any Apple products my, or owning any myself, um, it does it doesn't have me so anxious that um, I'm like waiting to buy something. Or, but I do like how they're going to the newer standards like USB three, and yep. um, they are making bigger retina displays. That is one thing that almost made me go to an iPhone 4S is the retina display. So, I mean, they do make nice things um, for their products. And um, I do think it's also nice how they're they're going for the high-resolution things uh, because that is the new standard, of course. I also wonder at what resolution they'll actually be happy or if they'll con- huh. continue to make it go higher. <laughs> but, I've actually wondered uh, that same thing, too, because the iPhone 4S and 4 have a resolution, I think, of 326 pixels per inch. And I can just see in, you know, four years or something, oh, we doubled it again, or, you know, something like that. <laughs> yeah. But one problem I do notice with that... Um, if you change the resolution on a computer, the smaller the resolution, obviously, the less detail, um, the less space you have. But um, it also requires more power because the higher the resolution, the higher quality and bigger the video needs to be to be clear. So things are actually getting smaller, and then we're forced to upscale the interfaces. So then on lower resolutions, they're obviously going to look bulky. And I do think it's good that they're getting rid of the smaller resolutions now. And I do think they're at a good point. But, yeah, then again, I do wonder when they're going to stop keep making it bigger because it will keep requiring more power. Right. So I I, I looked up what kind of phone you have. You have the uh, Droid Razor Max, I believe. And, Indeed, yeah. um you have a um, PPI of 256 pixels per inch. Yeah. So, I mean, you have um, uh, y- your, your phone's display, I think it's 4.3 inches or so. It is the same quality as the new iPad, so the iPad 3. So 256 pixels per inch. That's pretty good. I mean, that's great. Yeah, that is nice. I did want to make sure I went for a high-resolution phone because... Um, obviously, if if you're thinking about getting a phone and you're deciding between an iPhone and something else, you definitely want to compare to it. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know. I I think I think um eventually they'll definitely upgrade it again, and uh, I don't I don't think they'll ever be pleased. Uh, or or what they'll probably end up doing is finding some other spec, some other thing on the phone to to upgrade. Yeah. What I have noticed is there are things that that don't seem to be implemented too much into certain devices still. I mean, just recently, um, I tried to get some app, and it needed, um, what it actually required is NVIDIA's um, Te- Tegra. Yeah. Yeah, Tegra. Mm-hmm. yeah. so it's it's like a new graphic technology. But what I noticed is that even though I have, like, what for what some providers would call one of the best phones out right now, it doesn't have a Tegra chip in it. So Right. Um, it actually doesn't support that software. So um, there are definitely ways that they'll have to improve because there are standards and other things which um, people have to um, downscale things. Like, for example, if we go over the console side of things, um, you'll look at um, limitations of, like, the Wii versus the PlayStation 3 or Xbox 360. Um, there's certain games that um, that they'd make on the downloadable side of things where you, you download things to the console well Nintendo didn't put a big enough memory in, in their de- device for some games so um, some developers kind of gave up 
the idea of putting that game on the Wii, so... Um, and the Wii does seem to be the one that's falling behind faster than the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 because yeah, of that. Definitely. Well, yeah, so, so one of the uh, one of the ways Apple kind of combats that platform, I don't know, disintegration. Like, like you know, your phone needs a Tegra, but it doesn't have a Tegra, so it can't do something. Well, one of the ways I, the Apple kind of defeats that is by first making their own chips, which was really helpful. So there's only four types of chips right now in all of the Apple I, uh, iOS devices. So, I mean, as a developer, it's really easy to target specific capabilities as opposed to an Android phone where there's literally literally hundreds of chips that could be used. That is a big problem with uh, things like that. And I do like how Apple does that because what I like about it is that when I go to an app store and an Apple device, even though I don't own one, I've actually, I'm actually guilty of going to the app store, but I like how I can go to the iPad and then go to an iPhone or, and go to an, anything with the, um, Apple OS and I can actually find the same app which has been adapted or ported or whatever you want to call it. It's all compatible with, with the Apple devices at different resolutions. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's real, they do a great job at making their, their stores accessible and, you know, seem to be usable. Um, yeah, I, I think it's great. I loved it when I had my iPod touch, although I, I did give it up for an actual phone. So, I mean, <laughs> I don't know. You, you pick, you, 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 you win some, you lose some, I guess. Yeah. One controversial thing about, um, Apple and I don't think it has to do with Apple itself, but just how the developers are. Developers tend to charge more when the resolution gets bigger. It's like, even though it's probably easy for them to port it over, um, they, they like charge a couple dollars more for their app when it's on a, like an iPad compared to an iPhone. Right. I have noticed that too. But I, uh, in some terms, I think that's okay. Like on a phone, I should expect my app to be cheaper and then, on something a little bit bigger, it should be a little bit more expensive. And then on my computer, it should be most expensive since that's the thing that's probably the best. Like in terms of specs and capability, I mean, I guess that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. I don't really see a big problem with it, but I don't to have a problem having trouble adapting to that idea. Yeah. So this is the uh, point in the show where I would ask, where can we find you on the Internet? So do you, do you uh, use a public Twitter somewhere or do you use a Google Plus somewhere? Ah, well, I do have a Google Plus. Um, actually, the best way to reach me would probably be through contact information information on my website. Um, should I give you my website? I'll I'll put it in the show notes, so that's fine. All right. Well, through my website, would it have it have any other way to contact me? Google Plus, Twitter, yeah, okay. those kind of things. All right. And of course, this was a uh, Nexus special, all about WWDC, and. Uh, we we occasionally do these Nexus specials more timely, I might add, when our actual guests actually show up. You know, actually in person when they actually said they were going to. I'm just saying actually a lot because it's funny. <sighs> yeah, and of, of course you can find me, Ryan Rampersad, all over the place. You can find me here at the Nexus. You can find me on the Twitter at RyanMR. Of course, you can follow the Nexus on Twitter at the Nexus TV. And you can visit the Nexus website uh, at the-nexus.tv. But, of course, we don't have many shows right now because all of my hosts are now on vacation. Isn't that great? Well, it's been an honor to be on your show. So oh, I'm glad, I'm glad you, you enjoyed it. Yeah, maybe you can invite me back sometime. Oh, I definitely will. Yeah, hopefully we, hopefully we get to uh, do it again, yeah. Hopefully we can lure back some of those, those old hosts that that got a little lazier decided to go on vacation. <laughs> yes, hopefully we can figure out how to find them again and get them back on the show. Well, okay, it's been good. Yeah, thank you. Yep, have a good one. <laughs>